Hello, beautiful people. Happy Tuesday. I'm excited to be here with James Hattersley of We the Free. And we got a really powerful discussion today. It could be somewhat controversial. And um, we're going to be bringing in a lot of new thoughts, a lot of new awareness. So we're just going to open up this time for that. And, and everybody that's watching, please give StreamYard permission to use your name. And if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe. <laughs> um, thank you, James, for coming. Tell the folks about, about where you are and who you are, please. Oh, yeah. Thank you for the introduction, Marikita. Uh, hello, everyone. So, yeah, I I'm James. I'm a, uh, a founder and director of an animal rights organization, a vegan organization called uh, We the Free Animal Rights. Uh, I'm based in uh, Indonesia at the moment, but you can probably tell from my silly accent that I'm British. Uh, so I've, I've lived in Indonesia for about one year, which was actually the start of my journey into being a, a full-time animal rights activist. Um, I, I love it here. The weather's great, but I will apologize in advance just in case my internet goes rubbish and kicks me off. Uh, I will I will join very soon afterwards. Sometimes I just disappear for you know, about 30 seconds or something. But thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, I'm excited to have you because I went to one of your um, workshops and it was very enlightening. And I saw that, wow, we were on the same page a little, about a lot of things. Um, and we're, like, we're really both working hard. I don't even think I introduced myself. You know, I'm Mary Kita Solis, a vegan empowerment expert. And I really want to use the feminine energy to communicate better so we can empower ourselves as vegans to speak with understanding, um, not, not some sort of charted out data driven <laughs> conversation, right? Cause that would be masculine energy, which is fine. Masculine energy is what got me on this show. It's what got James here. You know, we had to connect at the right time. Right. And, but feminine's about understanding and speaking with people and, and listening and just, um, discovering the best way to communicate. So I'm excited about this conversation. And the topic is, should we respect non-vegans? And so please let us know who's watching, where you're watching from, what you think. If you think, yes, we should, or no, you shouldn't, let us know your comments. If you have questions or struggles, that's why we're here. James is an expert on this. He, he gives workshops all the time. And, 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 because of We the Free, you've got to give these workshops because you want to empower people. And tell us about We the Free, what you all do, and how communication is so important, please, James. Yeah, yeah, sure. So first of all, I'll just I'll just go back to one thing you said there, if that's okay, Marikita. Uh -huh. uh, you use like the labels like masculine energy and feminine energy, and I have to be completely honest. I'm not really familiar with what that means. Uh, I've not really used those labels before. I, I suspect that it it kind of applies to uh, sort of you know certain things that maybe we do every day without realizing or something like that. But I'm not familiar with that. But just to kind of answer your follow up question there, I guess uh, about like, we the free and what we do. So yeah, uh, we the free, a vegan animal rights organization. We um, we do. Uh, street outreach events or online activism where we basically I'll talk about the street outreach events we basically stand in the streets and hold like signs or televisions showing footage of uh, what happens to animals in the animal agriculture industry in farms and slaughterhouses and we confront people with the truth of what happens in these places and then have conversations with the with the hopes to inspire them to adopt a vegan lifestyle and the reason why it's so important to have really effective communication when we're doing that is because when we confront people with the truth, uh, it's quite often very shocking for them uh, and leads to, th to them to realize that uh, they are supporting something that goes strongly against the values that they hold. Uh, and as a result, they uh, sometimes it can kind of trigger their defensivenesses where they, uh, they don't want to feel like a bad person. So, they maybe reach for justifications or reasons why they aren't vegan, and that can lead to conflict uh, and very difficult conversations. So how we communicate about these things is very important to We The Free uh, in order to achieve our mission aims of you know, creating a, a vegan world. We want to empower our activists uh, to be able to have these very 
you know, difficult conversations in an effective way, which leads to the best outcome. So that's why we, we, we teach this. And this is why I've spent the last couple of years kind of honing my skills to deliver these training workshops to uh, hopefully allow our activists to have better conversations. Right. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Right. And that's what I want to do, too, is to communicate better for the animals and let go of myself. Um, and so I know I might lose a lot of people with a feminine energy talk, but feminine is just about discovery <laughs> and, and understanding and listening and not not having a mapped out plan like, OK, we're going to go out today, do this protest or this, you know, education, and then we're going to come back with 10 people that have converted. No, we're going to go see what we can plant seeds, right? That's what the feminine is. It's not about some linear charted process. It's discovery and awakening. And that's what we want to do. We want to awaken people, right? We want to res resurrect them from these old beliefs. So yeah, it's powerful. And Serenity is saying, well, Stephanie's in the Facebook. Welcome Serenity and, face and Facebook and, and Stephanie and everyone else who's watching. Um, she was saying she didn't think we were live in the Facebook group, but please let us know um, what you think about this. And I have a lot of, I, when I posted it first, I got a lot of comments of people saying, no, we should not respect non-vegans because look what they're doing to the animals and, you know, they don't deserve our respect. So what would you say to someone like that? First off, I'd start by saying I 100% understand that because I've been there. I've really been there. So uh, something that I, I didn't used to talk about, but now I kind of do feel free to talk about it. But I used to do like undercover work in farms and slaughterhouses, like investigations. I've done, I've liberated animals from these places. I've spent time in some hell holes, some really, really disgusting places. And I've seen like messed up things that have definitely traumatized me. And, you know, I, I've held a, a piglet in my arms while they're having a seizure and dying in, in, in some of these places. So, sorry if that's, you know, a, a jump to some really dark kind of theme for people that they might not have been un expecting. But, uh, yeah, I, I've seen some messed up things. And that definitely led to me becoming a very angry vegan, especially in my early days. I've been a vegan now for five years. Uh, but in the early days, I was very, very angry. And in many ways, I still am. But it's kind of like I kind of suppress those feelings of anger now. And the reason for that is because I believe it's more effective to uh, to not let that anger show in my conversations. And we can talk about why that is. But, yeah, my, the first thing I would say to somebody in answer to your question is I understand I've been there and we all feel this. We all feel the, this anger. There's, you know, not to lessen the, the scale of the problem. Right. What's happening to animals is uh, a global atrocity in scales that we can't even fathom it's it's horrible that i don't even have words to describe how horrible it is what happens to animals and i am 100 percent abolitionist and by that i mean i believe that every farm and slaughterhouse in the world should be closed down today and i will fight with every breath every fiber of my being to try and make that happen uh, and unfortunately kind of i found and we can explore some of the reasons for that i've found that by being angry and showing disrespect to people can really, really harm the, the likelihood of, you know, me inspiring them to change their behavior. Um, so, yeah, do, do you have anything to add on that, Marikita? Because I could definitely talk on that, for, just ramble off on that for two hours. <laughs> well, no, I understand. I feel what you said. There were some good points about defensiveness. People, When people get defensive, then you back them into a corner and they have to, I mean, they have to feel like they've got to defend myself now. Someone's attacking me. And that's natural human nature. If someone comes at us and attacks us. So, um, and, and the trauma People, I mean, of course, if we see something traumatic, we naturally want to run. That's our human nature, too. So when I feel like when we judge people for not wanting to see the truth, they they might not be at the right place in the right time, you know, and we can be so counterproductive by attacking. And someone was telling me, I think it was, um, I don't remember who said it, but there always needs to be an out right? Like for the person, it can't be where they're backed in the corner and their only, op their only option is to defend. There has to be a, a conversation that's open and bringing awareness so they can understand and perhaps take your point. But if you backed them in the corner and said what a horrible devil they are, 
then what's the option? They have no option but to fight to the death. And then they're just getting there, unfortunately, just saw, you know, creating more, um, they're just getting more, I don't even know what the word is, but more in, you know, impacted in their belief, right? Because there's like, okay, well, now I've got to think of all these reasons why I eat meat. And that's exactly what we don't want them to think of. <laughs> we want them to think of, you know, what, what would it be like to be a vegan? And this person is nice and kind and wow. You know, I, I've interviewed a few people on here, Susan Joyce, and she said, someone said to her, wow, that was the first time I've ever talked to a vegan that wasn't yelling at me. And, and that person actually listened and so, Definitely. When we want people to listen to us, we have to listen to them first without judgment, um, without shaming. A lot of people say they deserve to be shamed. And I mean, shaming, shaming shuts down growth. Shaming shuts down communication. And and that's and this is about getting rid of the ego. I think when we let go of ourselves and it's not us against them. (laughs) <laughs> but I'm here for the animals. And what's the best way for me to communicate for the animals? Forget about if my feelings are hurt, you know, but sure. I acknowledge my feelings might be hurt, but I've got to put myself to the side. And now I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> I want to hear what you say, James. Stop talking, Peter. <laughs> no, I've definitely got something to say on that. So first of all, I think it is worth us acknowledging the feelings that many vegans do feel uh, about this. Um, you know, sometimes being a vegan in a non-vegan world can be very isolating, right? It can be it can be tough. You know, we walk down the street and we're just bombarded with adverts for, you know, Burger King and McDonald's and KFC and, you know, all these like non-vegan products. And we sit at the table with friends and family and they're in celebration of the, you know, the dead animal on the plate in front of them. If you sit with friends and family while they're eating, I, I don't anymore. You uh, you walk in the supermarket and you're just confronted with dead body parts. And then when you try to talk to people about it, about this global atrocity, this, you know, the most pressing social justice issue of our time, when we try and talk to people about it, we are belittled, we're made fun of, we're attacked. Uh, you know, people get defensive. They don't want to hear about it. They say things like, oh, you know, I don't care. Life's too short. And they, they come out with all these you know, strange arguments that a lot of the time they don't even believe it. And it can be, um, sorry, what I mean by that is like, uh, you know, oh, well, if you're on a desert island or, or plants feel pain. And most of the time when people say these things, they, they don't genuine, genuinely believe in their heart that it's the same slashing, you know, chopping a carrot is, is, as it is stabbing a pig in the neck. They don't believe in their heart that those two things are the same, but they reach for these things because they're feeling defensive or whatever. And then when when we, as vegans, trying to advocate for justice, kindness, compassion, just a a better world, a kinder world, we've belittled, made fun of, and hit with these ridiculous arguments. We, you know, it's it's been described by some people as like dystopia, right? This vegan dystopia where all of a sudden you become aware of how messed up the world is and you're angry and people don't seem to care and i think for a lot of us our way of dealing with that of coping with those feelings is trying to you know rationalize what's happening and maybe uh, you know maybe that's why we reach for we reach for those defensive arguments like oh, well, you know, they deserve to be shamed and I'm just hitting them with, you know, a truth bomb and if they can't take it, it's on them. And those feelings are all, you know, they are reasonable feelings for us to have. So what I'd like to challenge people with is, is it effective to make them feel that way? And what you mentioned, you know, just to give an example, uh, I was at a a street event, a, a a demonstration with another animal rights organization in my hometown in England. And we were right outside of McDonald's holding screens, showing what happens in farms and slaughterhouses. And a farmer came up and started getting into a very heated debate with, uh, you know, one of my activism peers. And this debate, I could hear it. I think I was holding a screen at the time. And it went on for about 15 minutes, very confrontational, very angry, like shouting, like you're trying to put us out of jobs and blah, blah, blah. And then somebody swapped out and my time in the, you know, holding the screen was over. And uh, I kind of went and stood nearby. And then the the farmer like looked up to me and kind of said something to me. I don't know why, asked me something. And I just decided to kind of like join in the conversation. And 
this conversation could not have been going worse. And I communicated to the farmer in a way which I would describe as being hard on the problem, but soft on the people. And this is something that's very, like, it means a lot to me, being hard on the problem, as in I'm an abolitionist and this is wrong, and I want to end it by whatever means necessary. But soft on the people, as in not being disrespectful, even to the perpetrators of violence in times. So when I spoke to this farmer, I was asking him questions like, you know, I do these events a lot, and people tell me these animals are stupid and they don't really know what's happening. But you're an expert in this. Like, what, what have you got to say about that? And he told me, no, these animals are extremely intelligent. They know what's happening. And sometimes they're really scared, and that's heartbreaking. And then I asked him, you've probably seen some, you know, some really, you know, things that have been difficult to see. You've probably experienced things quite traumatic when dealing with animals and life and death. And he, he told me stories about how he'd cried his eyes out taking animals to slaughter. And uh, then I asked him the question, how would you feel if you could still make an honest living, but you didn't have to drive animals to their slaughter? And, you know, you could transition to plant agriculture. And he was like, yeah, that'd be pretty good, actually, but I wouldn't even know where to start. And can you see where I'm going with this? This this guy started out with a horrible confrontation. And by the end of it, I was sharing resources with him, like uh, the Vegan Society. And uh, I can't remember them now, but like Refarmed and these kind of initiatives that help farmers that want to transition. And unfortunately, this guy wasn't willing to exchange details. And I don't know if I don't know what happened, like maybe he's still farming. But by being hard on the problem, but soft on the person, that is the one thing that enabled me to reach common ground with this farmer and give him the resources that would allow him to transition away from animal farming should he want to. So I'm not saying that's the case every time, but in my experience, it's so powerful to just approach it from a different angle. Now, I despise some of the, you know, the acts that this farmer does, but I'm all about helping animals and being effective where I can. So, sorry, I probably spoke for way too long there, Marikita. <laughs> oh, you did it. <laughs> that's a lot of great points and um it's so true well first of all the feelings like the feelings are real the anger and the frustration you wake up and think oh my gosh you know what's going on in the factory farms here i am on this beautiful day and i was enjoying yesterday a picnic and stuff with my family and 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 then i stop and and i can get into that trap or the loop of the animals are suffering trap right and so i just have to I acknowledge the feeling, you know, these feelings are real. I'm so glad that I have them. I have a compassionate heart and that I can take action. And then I can say a prayer. And if you don't pray, you don't believe in God, even just a prayer to the trees. Help me, beautiful trees. You know, when I'm struggling in this moment, I see how powerful you are and how you keep going, how you sway back and forth and you're not cracking and bending, you know what you need to do and help me be more like you trees, you know? So, I mean, whatever it takes, right? Um, so yeah, all feelings are so important in the way that you connected with him where he was, instead of shaming and making him feel bad, showing him that just planting seed that there could be another way, you know? I mean, that probably has never been brought to his attention or, you know, in the way that you did it. And also, connecting with that humanity you know that's what's so important when we connect with that heart and without all the data and everything and the data is wonderful at the right time but the connection is so important to be empathetic to other people if we want them to be empathetic to the animals we've got to be empathetic to them first and be empathetic <clears throat> to ourselves <clears throat> and give us ourselves the kindness like if you need if you anybody needs to take a break <clears throat> from activism to to say it's okay you know take a break and recharge get with your friends laugh have fun and then go out there when you're ready because if we are not feeding our souls then we can't be effective right and then we can be very hard and angry so yeah and i see that <clears throat> aaron's watching and he calls himself an abolitionist too james so he's right there with you he's in the music field and he's saying absolutely we should respect pre-vegans because we were also pre-vegan um and we weren't able to have the necessary conversations if we don't from a place of respect yes respect is so crucial if we don't have respect we've lost them and and that even goes in social media too um what do you do about people that are hateful to you let's just say on social media um, because I know this is, can be a struggle for people. You know, if there's some, if someone says, "Oh, well, I sure do love 
I love cows too, but I love to eat them. Or, you know, some hateful comment. How do you deal with that? What would you recommend, James? Honestly, it depends what day of the week it is. In terms <laughs> of if I, if I have time to engage with this person in what, you know, the, the, the style of communication that I teach, which is like a coaching conversation, which in a verbal conversation that, that might be, depending on the, the person I'm talking to and how much they've got to say, that might be 20 minutes. So in a, in a you know, online, we're waiting for messages backwards and forwards, it, it might be several hours and I might not have time to really kind of deal with that. So in terms of online communications, I try to focus my resources. And what I mean by resources is my time, my effort, my energy, my kind of ability to deal with the non-vegan world that we live in. <laughs> I try to focus those resources in uh, the, where they can be the most effective, most impactful. So that might be, you know, sharing campaigns. It might be, uh, you know, reaching out to people who say like, hey, I need help going vegan and I can share resources with them to do that. That might be uh, promoting promoting like we the free campaigns or sharing the information uh, if it's just a, a troll online I probably don't spend that much time dealing with them because those conversations tend to fall into like a more of a debate format and you know we do need to speak up for the animals but we also need to be sustainable and I've done it in the past where I've spent hours and hours arguing with like you know anti-vegan trolls and in the end, it just kind of made me quite bitter and kind of, you know, deflated, I guess. So um, I guess know, know your limits and kind of, yeah, stick within the boundaries of your limits is my number one advice on that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think I read or I was watching a video. I don't remember who it was from, but they were saying that that isn't really an effective place. And, you know, for, for these conversations and really to to make a, a good impact. I mean, you can have a better, there are better ways to make an impact than that messaging thing, because I mean, that's like one of the worst ways of communication in the first place, texting mm -hmm. and communicating, you know, you don't know the feeling behind it. You don't know if it's sarcastic or what, right? And it's anybody can take a quick jab. So yeah, I know, but I mean, I, that's one reason I don't post things. <laughs> I try to keep my posts very um, I don't want to post, this is just personally me because I know what I need and everyone makes a decision for themselves, right? In my Facebook feed, I want people to see that animals are, have souls and feelings. So I pay, post a lot of that. I'm lucky to be the um, leader of the animal ministry at my church. So I have a group there. And so I'm posting about pigs and their feelings and chickens and their feelings, right? So they make the connection. Hey, wait a minute. Well, what's going on? You know, I mean, it might take a long time, but at least I'm doing that. And that way, nobody's going to attack me. I'm going to say, hey, I'm a vegan. I do it and I love it. And that's it. I don't, I'm not asking you to do it. I'm just saying this is it. Nobody can argue with that. So that's really what I try to do. And as, I mean, like I said before, everybody chooses what's best for them. I'm not here to say what's best for anybody. I can help people with communication just like you can. So, I mean, and that's, um, I mean, that's where it starts. And what do you think would be the first thing that if someone wants to be an effective communicator, what do they need to bring to this the meeting, right? Or what do they need to let go of? I think uh, that's a really good question. Thank you, Marikita. I think uh, letting go of our ego is the first the th first step there because our ego is what leads. I, I don't know. Sometimes it might also get us the label of being, you know, preachy, annoying vegans that think we're better than everyone else, and you know, self righteous and things like that. And you know, because we are better than non vegans. <laughs> I mean, I'm joking, <laughs> but you know, maybe not. I don't know, but. <laughs> You know, uh, if if that, that ego is what leads to kind of people feeling judged and let's just be real. OK, real talk for a minute. Maybe it's not wrong to judge, you know, to, to judge non-vegans and, you know, morally wrong because uh, vegans are abstaining from cruelty and they're choosing a kinder and, and kind of more honest, not, not more honest, more, more compassionate lifestyle. And that is obviously better than choosing not to do those things. So I can understand, you know, judging non-vegans. Uh, unfortunately, this again, if there's one thing that I'd like to challenge your viewers on, it's the idea of balancing up what's right against what's effective. 
and it might be right to be judgy to be you know peed off to be you know disrespectful to be angry it might be right to have all those feelings probably is in some cases it, it probably is in many cases but is it effective so you mentioned shame earlier like shaming non-vegans and I am, you know, I am a bit of a nerd and I do read studies and look at animal rights research and, you know, even research which isn't animal rights, but it's from the social sciences. And there's decades of research in social science that shows that uh, shame is not an effective motivator of behavior change. For very few people, do they just feel shamed and instantly say, well, I guess I need to turn my entire life around and, you know, make some tough decisions. It just doesn't happen, unfortunately. Maybe it should, but it doesn't. So what is more effective is trying to inspire people. So we should try to, if, if we want to be better at communicating about these things, we should try to find out what is going to motivate this person to change their lifestyle and, and then like share with them only the relevant information that they need to be inspired to change their actions, to find out what's important to them. And the first place to start with that is asking questions, I guess. Asking questions, you know, maybe you do share with them that uh you just mentioned about the you know information about pigs and what they're capable of and cows and after that maybe it's just asking people questions like how does this make you feel what do you think about that rather than you know saying well you eat pigs and this is what they're capable of so you're a bad person and okay that's not how anyone actually communicates this normally but uh in essence it is so instead of kind of you know telling people you're wrong you're you're taking part in some evil asking them questions and asking questions is so powerful that's my number one tip my number one advice for how to be better at communicating about this is asking people questions on how do you feel about this and this is why you know some people that are you look at like earthling ed who people refer to him as like vegan jesus look at any of his conversations and he has very good conversations and the number one tool in his tool belt is questions Yes, it is. And he's very patient. I love it. You know, he's not coming from a place of desperation and not coming from controlling, right? He's coming from this powerful, peaceful place of wanting to understand because that's the only way that we can create a change is when we listen. Some people don't care about the animals like you're saying. We want to hear what's important to them. And then we say, okay, so the planet's important to you. Well, that that's why i love being vegan there's so many benefits to the planet and the rainforest right and then we when we start listening then the whole conversation changes and and even to say hey i know so i i studied a lot of um, chris boss who was an fbi negotiator and one of the things he says to do is to um throw out that i'm the bad guy right away like before they say anything about you you say it first yeah you might think i'm a crazy vegan who's going to push off this crap on you and you know and then the person usually says oh no i don't think that you know they, they <laughs> so just throw it out there i know you think i'm a loudmouth vegan <laughs> so yeah. um yeah but I think those are just some little tactics about communication and that's the key to go the way to go and so Anyway, I don't even know what my point was, but I'm looking at more comments, balancing what's right against what is effective, brilliant. And that is just so true. And when we get into this, this is right and this is wrong, that doesn't matter. What matters is what is effective. We're, we're not here to be right. Oh yeah, I'm right. And guess what? You're not vegan. Okay, well, was it effective? No. <laughs> um, and inspiration is greater than shame, yes. I'd really just love to draw attention to Aaron's choice of words in an earlier comment where he yeah. refers to non-vegans as pre-vegans. And I think that's perfect. I think it really just draws attention to the fact that, um, you know, just because somebody's not a vegan doesn't mean that they're not going to be in the future. And I think a large part of what drew me into activism in the first place is the shame that I did feel. Uh, you know, in this occasion, shame was uh, an effective motivator, but that's because I was ashamed myself. I wasn't shamed by other people. That's a, a feeling I, you know, I told myself, I don't like this. I need to do something about this. But I was ashamed at my 29 years of eating animals. And I was a big, big meat eater. I, I'm the sort of guy I would, you know, I, I would have, uh, I don't know why I'm laughing about it. Maybe like, a, maybe it's a result of the shame. I don't know, but I would eat bacon, bacon sandwiches like, you know, three plus times per week, maybe five days per week sometimes because the, the canteen in the 
you know, in my previous job, it was super cheap. I turn up there early for work and go and have a bacon butty to start my day. Uh, and you know, every single meal, meat, eggs, dairy, every single meal, I was a huge meat eater. And then the shame I felt once I actually realized that was wrong, really, really powerful to me. And it's like, it's completely redefined my life, right? But the important thing is there, I had never ever genuinely considered that eating animals was wrong. I'd never truly, con you know, people had told me like, oh, you know, maybe someone had told me like, oh, pigs suffer in slaughterhouses or something. But I was so deeply conditioned that it never really got through to me to think that that is actually wrong and I shouldn't do it. And at the, you know, the first time I, I actually watched documentaries and empathized with animals in slaughterhouse and things like that, that was incredibly powerful to me. But for someone to say that I was an evil person because I ate those animals for 29 years, I would like to think that I'm not because, you know, of all the things, all of the reasons, you know, that you, you could pull out like social conditioning, social pressure, you know, ignorance, lack of awareness, kind of all these things, right? So just thinking about me as a, as a pre-vegan in those days is actually a, a nice way to think back to my animal eating days that, you know, I wasn't a non-vegan, I was a pre-vegan. I, I don't know. I just like that idea of thinking about, you know, attitude, the attitude with which we go into these conversations is not only helpful in that way, but it's also helpful in terms of the effectiveness of the conversation the attitude with which, which, with which we go into the conversations. Humans, we, we are like emotional sponges, right? We, we don't even realize we're doing it. It's a subconscious thing, but we draw on the emotions of people around us. And if I go into a conversation gearing up for a confrontation, a fight, uh, you know, I won't even realize I'm doing it, but there will be subtle signs in my body language, the way I talk, the way I hold myself, you know, the way my body's positioned or if my fists are a bit clenched or if I'm like gnashing my teeth slightly or something much, much more subtle than that. People will feel that. People will feel that, you know, that tension in my body, the way I'm going in or judging confrontational. And they will then feel like it's a confrontation of fight and they're significantly more likely to get defensive. And it's probably worth just mentioning something from the training I do, um, if that's okay, Marquita. Yeah, please. In terms of when we go into conversations with this attitude, like it's a confrontation, we tend to fall into what's like a debate style uh, framework. And what I mean by that is like, I kind of put an argument to you and you've got to like defend or debunk it. And then you put an argument to me and it's kind of a backwards and forwards, a debate where I'm trying to prove that I'm right and you're wrong. And you're trying to prove that you're right and I'm wrong. And one of us has to be wrong in this situation. And whoever's wrong doesn't like it. We don't like to be wrong. It's just a natural thing for humans. And the only problem with that is the problem with having debates when we're having these conversations on the street is that studies have shown that when two people enter into a debate and they're forced to hold a position and defend a position, they're likely to leave that conversation even more convinced of their original position. Uh, and in activism, this is like in, in some you know studies, this is known as the backfire effect. So if we do go into these conversations, judging and not respecting these people and being disrespectful and trying to shame them, there's a very, very real chance that we might make them leave that conversation even more convinced that eating animals is right, nice, normal, natural, all these things. And none of us want that, right? None of us want to, you know, we do activism because we want to help animals, not convince people that they should eat them. I, I shouldn't have to explain that that's like the complete opposite of what we want. So even though you might feel complete disrespect to every non-vegan in your heart, please don't let it show in your conversation. Just try to kind of try to shed those feelings before you go into conversations about veganism. If not for you then and your kind of mental state and your sustainability, then please do it for the animals. Yeah. And if you if you start off by saying, you know what, I'm gonna start this conversation with compassion, understanding. I mean, really say it to yourself. Just take a breath and just sit here with your heart and say, you know what, I'm gonna do this for my heart. And then that's a whole shift of energy because people can feel that energy. So, um, I mean, I know that, like you're saying, those debates, and that's where it gets into on like Facebook or social media, him saying this, them saying this. And if someone, if someone's making fun or they make a mean comment, to me, that says, 
well, I was effective or <laughs> that maybe I could rethink what I've done here, you know, just kind of re refocus because I don't want people to feel bad. I don't, you know, I don't want to shame them. If they want to have awareness and, um, and, and just sit time with what's going on like you did, that's different. And I don't want anyone to live in shame. You know, it's great that you don't feel like you have to beat yourself up every day from the past. No, we, we're taking action now. We are all we all were programmed like this in, in this meat eating belief, right? We were wearing meat eating helmets and now we've taken those off and now we can see. That's when it becomes so important, like Aaron was saying, pre-vegan. We're not judging them. We know that they can put take that meat-eating helmet off too, and they can put on a vegan helmet. So now we're going to have an impact to make it longer <laughs> for them to put that vegan helmet on, or we can make it quicker, right, with the way we interact with them. It's coming through compassion and understanding and listening. Like I asked a friend of mine, what's keeping from being vegan? Well, I love steaks. Okay. Well, at least, at least we know now, and I'm not going to judge you because I love steaks too. I know what it's like, love to eat meat. Okay. And I was there. So anyway, and what do you think? Oh, I hear people saying that this, that this backfires for them, that they, they, they go up to someone in the grocery store that has meat in their cart and then they launch kind of an attack or they say, well, you know, what's da, 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 da. or the cashier at the store will say, how? How was your day? And say, my day was it's horrible because I just saw all that meat, all those animals' bodies on the thing. So what would you say about this? Oh, wait, I'm not hearing you, but I'm not sure. Why? Sorry, yeah. No, how am I just muted yourself? We've got a YouTube troll in the comments. Yeah. Can we just ignore that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, so yeah, there's a, a bit to unpick there, but in terms of the the you know sharing with the cashier that um, you know you've had a terrible day because you've just seen dismembered body parts of animals in the in the fridges, I actually think it's it's fine to share that vulnerability. I think when we share that vulnerability, it doesn't it usually doesn't come across as like judgmental and uh, kind of being a pretty vegan or anything like that. If it's done from a you know if if that's how you genuinely feel. And I've seen similar things where people have obviously been very, you know, wanted to explore those feelings like, huh, why, why does that hurt that person so much? You know, why is that person so shocked by what they've seen? So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not against that. When it comes to going and attacking somebody, you know, you may, maybe not even attacking, maybe just going and talking to somebody who's got some meat, like, do you know what happened for that to get there? The intention there is really good. And only because I'm because I'm like a nerd and I read studies and things, I wouldn't do it because studies have shown that when people are engaged in an act of violence, like eating meat or purchasing meat, they're significantly less likely to see it as wrong. They're significantly less likely to see the a problem with it. They've done, you know, I could talk at length about the studies and how they did it, but maybe in the interest of time, just trust me on this one. So when people are eating animals or purchasing them or, you know, they're taking part in that act of art, they don't see it as being immoral. And what I would try to do instead is try to create opportunities where people are, you know, eating vegan food or something like that and talk to them about the impact of the positive impact of that vegan food and and how it probably aligns with values that they've got um so you know instead of doing that maybe i'd set up a table outside the supermarket giving away some free samples of vegan food or something like that but again i don't think there's anything wrong with what you said i just uh or, or you know that kind of protest i just wouldn't do it because i don't believe it's as effective as creating opportunities to talk to people about veganism and vegan food when they're not actively engaged in that, you know, the act of eating or purchasing animal products. Yeah, and I think that definitely the energy you carry matters. And um, also, I think there, there's, I think when we start to look at who's ready, you know, who's ready? I mean, like this person in the store, we don't know anything about them. Are they ready to hear it? Are we going to give our energy to that, some, to that person? Or are we going to make a connection with someone that we do know that's more on the journey of pre-vegan and take our energy to that person, right? So 
Okay. There's a quote I like to. Oh, sorry, sorry, Marikita. Okay. I think because of the lag, then it seemed like I was talking over you. Sorry. Uh, there's a quote I like to remember. It's uh, people might not remember what they say, but they'll always remember how you made them feel. Um, and and uh, you know, with that aspect, uh, with that in mind, the uh, you know, I would focus more on having positive interactions with people. But yeah, I, I do think we should drop the vegan bomb from time to time. I, I'll wear vegan t-shirts when I'm out and about, and uh, you know strike up conversations with people about it but i try to do it in a positive way and they might not be ready but you know basically what we're doing is marketing right we're, yeah. we're marketing vegans and we're trying to sell it and we can learn things from the fields of sales and marketing and they say what, what's the statistic it's something like an average person has to see an advert seven times before they are you know by before they're impacted by it before if, if they were going to buy it as a result of the advert takes them seven times to see it before they do so yeah i think it's great that veganism is becoming very much at the forefront of uh you know our minds you see it everywhere there's news stories articles about it people wearing t-shirts stickering chalking all those things but uh just i just focus on the interactions that we have with people around that being positive ones so, yeah. Yeah. And that's what, that's what Earthling Ed is doing too. He wants them to leave with a positive feeling of veganism, right? He doesn't want them to feel yeah. bad about anything. So just that's the takeaway <laughs> that we all communicated in peace and that you don't see me as a threat or a hater, but as someone who's living a very, a life aligned with, you know, their values. So. And then that's how we can sleep at night is when we say, when we know that we're doing, that we're living the life that, that we were meant to, what we were called to our mission, you know? So we don't have to change everyone, but we can do our part in changing people, right? Knowing that you're doing your part here and, and people are doing their part all over the world. So, yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, so, do we need to... Do we need to do anything about this troll or do you normally just ignore oh, them? I never had a troll before. So welcome to the first troll. <laughs> Asking questions is essential. It's one of the best lessons about communication that I'm still learning. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Earthling Ed is very aware about his intentional open arms posture when he has conversations. And that's what I love, too, is um, about inviting people to have a conversation. You know, that's when it's nice when you're not, hey, <laughs> but would you like to hear more? You know, and if, um, I think that's a beautiful way of, of interacting with people. And I love the way that you talked about in your workshop about, you know, when you go head on up to someone. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So I think you're referring to like how I normally start conversations about veganism, uh, you know, at uh, events in the street um so obviously this this won't necessarily apply quite as much to like you know if you're sitting next to someone on the bus or if you're in an, uh, an elevator at work or something like that but uh basically yeah there's certain things that i've come to realize about the way we approach people um so what i mean by that is if uh if you're walking down the high street and somebody walks up to you to talk to you it's normally for one of a very few you know a very small amount of reasons so they want to sell you something they want you to you know maybe it's for a charity or they they want to like uh, you know hand you like a flyer or some some kind of promotional material they want you to sign up for something they want something from you and as a result we don't even realize we're doing it it's subconsciously but when people make eye contact with us in the street and walk towards us instantly we kind of like panic like oh no this person wants something from us and we tend to just put our eyes down and walk away so like if I notice if I notice someone's like you know watching the footage that we're sharing and they're clearly you know uh, affected by it I'll just kind of gently walk walk up to them from the side and stand side by side with them and kind of watch the footage with them and, and just ask them questions like oh do you know what's going on here um, and that's just you know like a, a nice friendly warm way to kind of start a conversation without me walking up like hi we're all a bunch of vegans and we want you to go vegan and of course we are too but that's not what i say <laughs> yeah i love that you know just asking questions are you or even just you know oh well 
thanks for <laughs> thanks for joining us or something, you know, being nice, you know, would you like yeah. to know more? That's very non-threatening. Nobody's going to get mad at you for saying, would you like to know more? I mean, most likely, I mean, I guess somebody could, but it's non-threatening and that's, it's peaceful communication. <laughs> that's essential that we speak peacefully because I know in my relationships, like with my boyfriend, when I start to get angry, I mean, sure, I'd love to tell him off, but I have to like, okay, I'm just going to have to say, I got to go because I'm going to um, <laughs> really regret what I say, you know? And so <laughs> it's very, a, a very important to think before speaking and like to take your time when we communicate. And so the brain shuts down when we get I mean, that's a study show. Your brain shuts down when you're stressed. And so this is such an emotional, emotionally um, charged area that we've got to remain calm and deep breathing can help when we're feeling frustrated. You know, if we're feeling like someone's not listening to us, instead of continuing with the conversation to thank them for their time <laughs> and say, okay, well, I hope you have a good day. And, and to know that it's okay and, and we don't have to feel bad about that. And I'm sure that happens all the time with you, James. What would you say to that? I mean, and then, and then all the people that are working with you, how do you help them to feel good about what they've done? Let's just say no one wanted to know more or they're feeling like we didn't make an impact. What would you say to those people or all of us? <laughs> I just want to understand that a little bit better. So what would I say to activists that feel that way? Or yes. what would I... Okay, yeah. so they feel like, you know, people didn't want to know more. They didn't, you know, that maybe they feel that they didn't have an impact today. Is, is that the question? Right. Cool. First of all, hi, hi Tricia. Lovely to see you. Thanks for thanks for joining and commenting. And thanks for joining my last couple of workshops. But, yeah, just, just to answer that question, Marikita. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I think I'd, I'd start by saying that, uh, again, a little bit of a callback to what I said about, you know, we have to see things seven times maybe before it really makes an impact. And and you mentioned as well earlier, uh, Mariki, to some people, maybe they're just not ready for that message yet. We almost like we just need to hit people with the right information at the right time. And at the end of the day, it's not our job for that person to go vegan or to force that person to go vegan. Our, our, our role here is to confront them with the information uh, and, and, you know, it's up to that person to make themselves accountable. You can't, you can't expect people to do something for other people. They need to do it for themselves. They need to want to be inspired to do it. And maybe they're not quite ready yet. But even if we didn't get them over the finish line, even if we didn't get them to be 100% like, okay, I'm going vegan on the spot, they, we could have still, I know this is like a really cliche thing that vegan sales are time but it's so true we might have planted the seed that will you know we don't always get to see those seeds blossom into a beautiful flower but you know maybe it will anyway and i think back to the conversation that made me go vegan and it was a conversation in my kitchen with a friend who she watched a documentary i think it was dominion no not Dominion, earthlings or something like that watched a documentary and basically gone vegan overnight and I had a conversation with it and I was so like judgy. I was like, that's so extreme. Like, why don't you just eat a bit of cheese now and again? And where are you going to get your protein? And all these ridiculous things that non-vegans say. I was that ridiculous non-vegan. <laughs> uh, you know, full of prejudice and things like that. And she probably left that conversation feeling quite deflated. Like, oh, God, I really thought James would be more understanding. And then like, I set out to do some research. Like, I either need to prove her wrong or like, find out the truth in this matter. I don't know. I'm, you know, I'm, I mentioned I'm a nerd. I'm quite analytic. I'm quite data-driven. I set out to do some research and basically turn myself vegan over the space of the next week. And when I, when I mentioned it to her a couple of weeks later, like, oh, by the way, I'm vegan now, she nearly broke down crying. Like, oh, my God, really? Like, what happened? Because I just couldn't get through to you. And I, I, I explained, well, actually, you kind of did get through to me. It was just gnawing it in the back of my brain like... You know, I need to find out the truth behind it because surely what she's saying is not true. So uh, that was that was the case for me. It might be for other people. So planting seeds, like it's true. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what that was a great point that you you brought up is that we might think we know what they think. Like we might think, well, they don't care, right? And then we get mad at them. But the truth is, we don't know really what's going on inside their mind. You know, we just don't know. And like if they're being defensive, maybe it's because of the trauma, 
right, that they might have had. I know that there was a guy that was forced to, like, lived on a farm and forced to kill animals, and it was traumatizing to him. But he was a farmer, you know, he grew up to be a farmer. That's all he knew, and so he had to defend that position. So um, who knows what happened in their past, or who knows what's really going on in their minds and hearts, and why are we trying to, you know, think that we know everything when <laughs> we really don't. I mean, that's that's the ego again, right? That ego is just like coming up and, <laughs> you know, taking away our peacefulness. Oh, sorry. I think I think I lagged for a second then, but I definitely heard what you were saying, Mary Peter. Um, I guess one other thing to say on that, which might be a bit of a shameless self plug, but uh, if you don't mind, like in terms of knowing whether or not we've been effective uh we the free has created some something really kind of revolutionary to allow us to at least start that process of knowing the impact that we've had whether that's a conversation at church or a conversation on the street or a post online we've basically built this thing called my stats my stats wtf is a website uh and it works in combination with I hope you don't mind me talking about this. Mary. I want you to tell everything. Okay. <laughs> tell away. MyStats.wtf is a website, and it works in combination with another website, 3 movies.wtf. So when we want to share some vegan resources with people, so we, we share, we give a card to someone in a conversation at church or on the bus, a card to someone or on the street that's got 3 movies.wtf and our own little referral code on there. So mine is my 3 uh, movies.wtf forward slash James. And I give that to someone and it takes them to a website with some documentaries on like Dominion, Seaspiracy, Game Changers. It's got like vegan mentoring services like Challenge 22. It's got like a, a, a vegan live chat that people can join and talk to vegan mentors there. And then it's got petitions people can sign, all these vegan resources. And the beauty of it is anything they do on that website will be tracked back to the refer referral code they use to access the site through my stats so when i log into my stats and look at my code forward slash james i know how many people have watched dominion watch seaspiracy watch game changers they've signed up to challenge 22 they've taken a, a vegan pledge or you know all kinds of data and things and i can analyze it and i can use that to basically decide where to spend my time so i found that the posts that i make on facebook you know, don't really seem to be getting that many people to do it. So I focus more of my time on Instagram and I focus more of my time on street outreach, which seems to get more people to do that. But that said, everyone's different. And if you can make really bomb YouTube videos that just drive like, you know, you spend a few hours editing that video or even a few days editing that video and you include in the description of that video to find out more, go to three movies.wtf forward slash, you know, whatever you want, five characters. And you find out that editing that video was worth it because 20 people went to the website and 10 of them watched Dominion and four of them signed up for a, a vegan challenge. You know that was worth you spending those few hours there because the likelihood of someone watching Dominion and go and sign up for a vegan mentoring service, that those are pretty strong, uh, you know, indicators that they've been affected by the content you've put out, right? So you know it's worth you doing that. So you can spend more of your time doing that and less of your time arguing with trolls on Facebook. <laughs> That's wonderful. I love it. So, yeah, definitely. I know we don't have that much time, but I was looking at this. Um, I mean, I could talk forever, but anyway. <laughs> Vistopia Anonymous. Um, that's Aaron saying that. Um, and we'll have to check that out. And thanks, Trisha. I'm, I'm excited. Trisha's a very loyal supporter. And thanks everybody, you know, Serenity and Aaron and everyone else that's watching. But I want you to tell everyone about We the Free. And I want you to tell, um, I want you to just take, o take over the conversation for these last few minutes that we have about um, anybody that's thinking that, that they want to make more of an impact. You know, what are ways that they can and how can they get in touch with you um, to be a part of We the Free? And is We the Free, where is it located? Uh, I guess from a, a legal point of view, it's located in the UK just because I'm a UK resident, but we are a global org organization. So at the moment, we've got uh, we've got teams in the UK, Canada, here in Indonesia. We've just started one in Berlin. We're just starting one in Uganda. We've got them in North America. We've got them, uh, I don't know, all over like six, I think seven countries now, Scotland, 
I, I can't even keep up with it. We, we've kind of grown really fast. But basically, uh, We The Free was conceptualized a couple of years ago. We did like a, an animal rights survey of uh, 1,100 vegan activists from around the world and asked them like all sorts of questions about their advocacy. And we found some like really common themes of people experiencing burnout, toxic communication, decreasing their activism after a couple of years, not receiving any training, not knowing their impact, not having much faith in their leadership of their organizations. And we basically built an organization from the ground up based on the strategy formed just from that uh, you know, from that survey and from speaking to people and finding out what they wanted. So we built an organization to be basically what the what the vegan movements told us they want. And if I it was to give you just to be respectful of everyone's time, an elevator pitch of three things that are really different from any other organization that I'm aware of. The first one is that we really prioritize community building because we know that we can't do our best for the animals if we don't take care of ourselves. Right, so we, we don't only do activism, although it's like the main thing we do, we also do uh, community events where we go go and do like picnics in the park and maybe a, a, a you know a beach cleanup or a, a you know a a, cha a run to raise money for a, an animal sanctuary like a, a sponsored walk or uh, we do like potlucks and uh, we go to animal sanctuaries and volunteer and be around animals and other vegans and it's great and we form friendships and do team building and you know get more respect for vegans in the community and recruit new volunteers while we're at it, which is always a bonus. So that's the first thing. The second thing is our data and analytics, which I've just spoken to you about. We, we, we want to you know, know how impactful our activism is so that we can be more strategic. Animal agriculture industries definitely use data and analytics to get better at selling their products of, of death to us. And if we want to beat them, we need to get smarter and be more organized and strategic. And yeah, it makes sense, right? And the third thing is like learning and development. So we put on regular trainings, not just in terms of the communication ones I do, but nonviolence, uh, sustainable activism, leadership skills, conflict resolution, things like that. Um, so those are the, that's an elevator pitch on We The Three. And we basically, we want to start animal you know, animal defender teams in every city, every village, every parish, every borough, all around the world. We want to start teams basically everywhere that there's not activism right now is our priority. Um, and we're desperate to start activism teams from the ground up. And also, you know, if, if maybe teams kind of just activism just stopped in your city over the past two years because of toxic communication, infighting, things like that, then maybe where, where the the team to help you get it kick-started again so we'd absolutely love to help anyone here that you want there to be an animal rights team in your city please get in touch you can do that by going to activism.wtf our website forward slash get involved or just go to the get involved section and you can apply to be an organizer through there or just send us an email hello at activism.wtf uh, and we will help you with getting a team started so we offer induction training financial support you know we've recently just bought a bunch of televisions and batteries and things for our teams uh you know we buy cards and signs and help people get started with you know whatever masks they might want to wear and just get teams started that's our priority and then giving them ongoing support to have impactful well-attended events and you know just wholesome communities surrounding them i guess well, that's amazing. Yeah. I mean, you're doing so much. And what if, let's just say I wanted to be part of We The Free, but I didn't want to hold a TV or go on the street. Maybe I was scared to do that. What, what, how could I help be a part of the organization still and help? Are there other areas that I could help in? Oh, yeah. Great question. So many ways. So uh, first of all, like we want to do online activism as well. So sign up for My Stats, create a code, start doing posts, like linking people to three movies and seeing how it works and talk to us as well we want we want feedback uh, but secondly we you know just going on the streets is not the only way to help animals if you've got any specific skills that you think could help our organization get in touch we we are always recruiting volunteers to work on our media team so that's like 
content creation, making, you know, making reels for our Instagram or TikTok or, you know, helping make memes for our Instagram or writing blog posts. And Marikita, maybe you want to guest write a blog post to go on our website or something like that. But anyone here, if you're a content writer, a content creator, a video editor, uh, an SEO expert, uh, you're an expert in web design or something like that, you can still volunteer your time with us. Obviously, the And sorry, I know I lagged then, but hopefully you heard what I was saying. You said obviously then, and then I lost you. Ah, yeah. Um, obviously, there would need to be like a, an induction process, and we've got like brand guidelines and things like that. But you know, the super boring stuff. But yeah, yeah, there's lots of ways to get help. So just get in touch, basically. Just email us hello at activism.wtf. Tell us what's your specialities, what's your skills, and we'll see if we can find a way for you to help us. Uh, and if not, like we can still talk, to, we can still help you to do activism in your area. We've got lots of, you know, creative people on our team that can come up with things. So, for instance, we've recently been working with a guy who, as far as he knows, he's the only activist in his city. And we're working to just like have him set up a stall with, you know, even though he might not be able to hold a, an event with four televisions and a bunch of activists stood around. We're still going to help him to have impactful events, but just thinking outside the box and doing a bit of problem solving. So it's not just about having huge, you know, demonstrations with 30 people in attendance. I'd actually rather that, that split up some of those 30 people and go into some different cities and reach more people, you know? Well, I'm excited that I asked that question because <laughs> I know that a lot of people think, well, I can't do that. I mean, I don't know if I could go do that, be on the streets with the TV. I'd be scared to look at the TV, right? Or the, you know, so yes, I'm glad you gave us that wonderful, those wonderful resources. And then Aaron is saying I can help with music for videos. Yes, because he's a composer and he's got some um, wonderful videos. Um, so Ooh, yeah. Get in, touch. <laughs> if, if, if you get in touch. And uh, I guess the one other thing I'd say to that is, the first time I ever went into the street outreach, I was completely petrified. I was so scared. And I think the reason is I was I was scared that I'm not good enough at talking to people and I don't won't know what to say. And if somebody hits me with a question and I don't know the answer to it, then they're going to say, aha, got you vegan. Now I don't have to go vegan because you didn't know the answer to my question. And honestly, like looking back, that feels kind of silly, but that's how I felt. That's 100% how I felt. And what I found was I went to an event met a bunch of super friendly people and they said to me you don't have to talk to anyone today you can just shadow this guy he's been doing it for the past year he's really good just listen to him talk to people and then you can come for some food with us afterwards and we all went and hung out and we had some vegan food and i was surrounded by vegans and i thought these are my people i've you know i've met my tribe i belong here and you know fast forward a few weeks and i was there at the next one and i decided actually there's nobody talking to that guy and i can't see anyone else free so i'm just going to go and try it out and then, okay maybe it wasn't the best conversation but oh my god i felt so empowered the first time i had a really good conversation and that person was like thank you so much you've really raised you know opened my eyes to this you've made me aware where i wasn't previously and yeah i've got i've got to go away and do some hard thinking about this i was so empowered i just thought like wow this is amazing i want to do this every weekend and then i did <laughs> You know, so my number one advice would be get out there and try it. Even if you don't feel comfortable, you know, wearing a mask and holding a TV or you don't feel comfortable talking to people, just ask, can I just come and listen to some conversations or can I just come and take some photos and put them on my, you know, put them on my blog or my website or can I record some video? Sorry, I, again, I just cut off okay. then. I don't know what's happening to my internet, but uh, hopefully you got that. <laughs> well, we're getting the gist of it. You know, can you can I record? Just come and be a part of it and then just watch yeah, and learn. Yeah, I love that, right? Because I know that a lot of people are hesitant and they, feel, they might feel afraid. And just, I mean, the supportiveness of the group is, is, is amazing, right? Just go and see. I mean, you don't have to do anything. Just go and stand and watch and see yeah. I like it, and then feel it out does this feel right yes no whatever you know but i love that and this is so inviting and um well i want you to so everybody can get a hold of you are you on facebook tell everybody yeah i'm on facebook uh yeah i'm on facebook as james hattersley uh, unfortunately i can't seem to type in the chat so maybe you can just put my name in there uh, afterwards or, we can go back and yeah. put it in. 
Sure. Or the best, the, actually the best way for people to get in contact with me is by email uh, because I, I don't always, you know, accept everyone onto Facebook if I don't know who they are. So the best way to get in contact with me is email james at activism.wtf. James at activism.wtf. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So then we'll put that in the chat and, um, well, I'm just so thankful for this conversation that could have gone on for hours and hours and hours, but <laughs> you'll have to come back definitely because there's a lot to talk about. You know, we've always got, that. yeah, pre-vegans are coming in all the time. So next month we're going to, all some of those pre-vegans will be here, you know, <laughs> wanting Hopefully to they come back as vegans. Yes, that's right. Right. We're always bringing new awareness and seeing the shifts. So thank you for this wonderful impact you're making on the world. And everybody, I encourage you to reach out to James. He's inspirational and taking action. And that's what we all need to do is get up, take action in whatever way you can, your own special way. <laughs> so <laughs> thanks, everybody, for watching. I am uh, just honored for this. And thank you, James. My pleasure. All right, have a beautiful afternoon. <laughs>